So hi everyone, thank you for being here, especially thank you to those who have come back a second time. Um, thank you for giving me another chance to not suck. So let's get started. I have so much to cover, I will probably run late, um, especially with questions because I do want everyone to have the opportunity to talk and ask questions about things. So let's get started with, it's not my clicker, it's, it's slightly weird. Thank you for the clicker. All right, about me. As you have just heard from Tim, um, I am VM Brasur, but you can call me Vicky because we're all friends here. Uh, I am an open source policy and strategy freelancer. So my little sales pitch, if your company needs any help with open source, you know, compliance or contributions or anything open or free with a capital F, come and find me, I'm your gal. I'm also an author and community moderator for opensource.com, so don't be surprised if I rope you into writing an article for us. Here is my contact information in really, really, wow, that's big, um, in really large letters. Uh, at the top is my Twitter handle. It's also at the bottom of every single slide. Uh, in the middle is my free node IRC nick because I don't do Slack. And at the bottom is my email address. I encourage you to use all of this information. So the first time I gave this talk, it was with a co-presenter, Josh Berkus. He, uh, I want, need to thank him and uh, give him lots of kudos for helping present the very first version and coming up with a lot of content here. So thank you, Josh. So I will refer to Josh multiple times throughout the talk. So why am I up here today? Um, and why am I the one talking to you about public speaking? This is a list of the events at which I've spoken. This is just the events, not the number of times I have presented. By the end of 2017, I will probably have presented about 20 times. That's me trying to cut back and failing really hard. Um, yeah, Paul, you know this pain. Um, so I know my way around a conference podium, and I'm going to share a lot of that knowledge with you. And I'm going to start here. These slides are already available on Internet Archive here at this first URL. They are available both with speaker notes and without. They're kind of useless without. If you don't get this URL now, don't worry because I'll show it at the end and leave the URL up while we have final Q&A. But the second URL here, I'm very proud of this second URL. It's a GitHub repo and it's full of dozens and dozens and sometimes on a weekly basis even more resources on public speaking, specifically about technical conferences but there are other types in there as well. <clears throat> so that's a great resource, and I will direct you to that multiple times. So these are the 10 steps to better public speaking here. The first five sections are about preparing your talk. And the final five are about actually presenting it, the before, the during, and after of presenting it. Now, Things are going to move really, really quickly. There is an entire GitHub repository full and full of information on this, so I'm naturally not going to cover it all in 90-ish minutes. So there are a lot of things not included in here. This is more like an introduction, a highlights, a greatest hits, a these are the things that everybody screws up, so maybe you want to know about them sort of presentation. <clears throat> It's not an advanced deep dive. If you need more information, come find me, go to the repository, contribute to the repository. Pull requests, welcome. Now there is more than one way to do it, Pearl. <laughs> um, you don't have to make your talks adhere to everything I'm going to say. You know, take from this talk what you need, what you want, and leave what you don't need, right? So if you were here last year, you're I'm sure familiar with the phrase, you do you, honey. And that really holds true across the entire presentation here. <clears throat> now, if you have questions, I will pause between each section. So you can get one or two questions in there. I will also stick around for as long as necessary until they kick us out afterward if you have questions. Now, if you need to step out for any reason, you, there used to be a break in the middle of this, but it really slowed us down and made us go too late. If you need to step out for any reason whatsoever, please do so. I'm not going to get offended. My ego is not that fragile. Just go do your thing. So let's get started, shall we? <clears throat> now a presentation is a lot like a product. It's like any software you create. And like that, if you don't take the time to figure out what your user is like and what your user needs, then you're probably going to start writing the wrong thing for the wrong reason for the wrong person. 
So take some time to learn about your audience before you start planning out your talk. This assumes, of course, that you have a conference in mind. You might have noticed in the 10 steps I did not pick or include find a conference. Um, if you need help finding a conference, let me know and I can do that. But that really didn't make the cut for this talk. So there's lots of things you can potentially look for for your audience, lots of information you can collect. This is obviously not a complete list because people are complex, wibbly wobbly, squishy things. But some of the things you should look for in particular are the technical level of your audience. <clears throat> What's the technical level of the average attendee, not like your exceptional attendees? Are they seasoned programmers? Or are they on the non-programming side of software development? Right? You need to know this before you start creating your content. The expected size of your audience really matters as well as far as your content. Were we only like three or four people, we would be doing a lot of hands-on stuff here, but with like I don't know, 87 or however many of you there are, I can't do that. And so I have a different presentation for this, for this group, than I would for a smaller one. Then there's the human language. I have known people to assume that everybody is going to understand English and every conference they go to, they will understand English and this has bitten them in the butt. So it doesn't take much to do a little research and confirm that your audience actually speaks your native language. It doesn't have to be English, it can be whatever you're most comfortable speaking in. So do check on that, otherwise you might screw up. And then there's culture. And when I say culture, a lot of people think like geographic culture, and that does actually come into it. If I'm presenting in Melbourne, I might present this differently than I would in New York City or in middle America because they're just different cultures and people interact and understand different examples. Um, but there are other sorts of cultures here. Uh, I typically present in free and open source software conferences. And the way I would talk to somebody who is really into capital F, yay, go freedom, is different than I'm going to be speaking to somebody who is at an Apple conference. Yay, go Apple. Um, and finally, Try and figure out some of the current events happening in your community and whether they might be relevant to your topic. For instance, if there happens to be a new version of an operating system coming out, or if you are super duper just make the bloody announcement already excited about a new iPhone, um, that's not me at all. Then you know, figure these things out and learn them before you walk into a session. I have had the unfortunate situation before of addressing a group of people who recently lost one of the founders of their free and open source community. And so everyone was still just completely struck by what had happened. <clears throat> I had to change some of the stuff in my talk so I could be sensitive to the fact that people were mourning in the room. And I had to change my content. And had I not done that, I probably would have offended half of my room. So do be aware of what's going on in your audience community. Now, how do you learn this? Unfortunately, conference organizers are not very good at sharing this information. They have it because they have to provide it to sponsors. Here's what our audience is going to be like and the sort of people who will be seeing your brand. Right? So they have to know this sort of thing. But they don't often think to present it to the speakers. Um, and that's just because conference organizing is really complicated and really busy and things get passed over. But that doesn't mean they don't have it. So do ask them for it and they'll be really glad to provide that information. That's the easiest way to get this. Um, but it doesn't always work because they're busy and they don't reply quickly. So take it on yourself. This is your responsibility because it is your talk. So you go out and find information about your audience. <clears throat> So social media has done great things for spying on people. So you can learn a lot about the people who would potentially be at your conference by seeing who's excited about it, who's, it, who's proposed a talk to it. That's part of your potential audience. Who has been to a prior version? Who has been to one of the nine dev worlds in the past? Have they tweeted about it? Have they posted on Facebook or, I don't know, Google Plus? Is that a thing anymore? Um, <clears throat> So you know, go and see what they had to say about it and what sorts of people they are, and that will give you a lot of information. Uh, you also, however, can define it yourself up front 
In your talk proposal, as you're writing up your idea, you can say, I expect people to be of this technical level, to have familiarity with that sort of software, to speak Mandarin, perhaps you're going to be presenting in Mandarin, and then your audience self-selects because you have defined it up front, but you've been able to define it, which means you can now use that information to craft the appropriate talk for your audience. So, <clears throat> we had, did, was anyone at the BDD talk or workshop this morning? Um, yeah, there's probably a fair bit of user research and user information in that, so um, unfortunately it wasn't recorded, but I'm sure that uh, that presenter is still around and you can speak to them more about user research, which is really what you're doing here for your audience. So do seek them out and ask them. But right now, are there any questions about learning about your audience? Okay, moving on then. <clears throat> so you know about your audience. You have some information about them. Now you have to craft your idea or come up with one completely. It's possible you don't have one in mind yet, but it should be well suited for that audience. It just can't necessarily be something that you think is really cool because they might not think it's really cool. So come up with an idea that's crafted to your audience. How do you do that? Well, if you have an idea already, great, you're covered. But if not, look at your experience first, right? Um, what are you working on right now? And this doesn't necessarily have to be at work. Could be something you learned at another conference and went home and started working on. Could be a side project. Could be, you know, in my world, it's probably some open source project you're contributing to. What challenges have you faced? technologically, socially, whatever it is. What challenges have you faced and how did you get over it? Did you get over it? Did it fail completely, right? Did, or were you successful? That, that gap between failure and success or sometimes the other direction, success to failure, any sort of thing like that makes really great fodder for a conference talk. People love that because we all have challenges and we learn from other people's challenges and how they overcame them. But there are other ways to do this. You don't just have to rely on your own experiences. If you want to do something that your audience will listen to that will be useful for them, how about you ask them? You know who they are now. You've done your research. So go out there and ask them. Now, this can be like a one-off sort of thing. Just fire something off to the Twitterverse and say, hey, you know, if someone were to, I don't know, talk about the perils of first contact, what would you want to learn from that talk? Or, uh, you know, what challenges have you had with your warp drive? And you can get ideas from them in little one-off ways like that. Or you can do what Josh and I did when we first came up with this. We came up with this huge, big, long, really convoluted and probably not academically correct survey. Um, put it on Google Forms, shared it with our networks, and said, if you have ever been to a tech conference, fill this in. And give us some information. What do you like? What do you not like? And we got to learn a lot of information from people that we then turned into part of this talk. Obviously, he and I have been doing this for a long time, so we also relied a lot on our experience. But that was a great way to learn what our audience wanted to hear about, what is bothering them. And it really shaped a lot of this talk the first time we gave it. Whatever your idea, whatever you come up with, though, if the audience isn't going to get anything out of it, why would they show up? Why? They, they can't just randomly devote an hour of their life to you when they could be watching Game of Thrones. So be very clear with them as you write your proposal, as you write up your idea for the conference, be very, very clear what they're going to get out of it. Because if they can't tell for your talk, but they can tell for somebody else's, then they will go to someone else's. Don't make them guess. This is neither the time nor the place for clickbait. Be very specific in your talk. By the end of this session, you will know how to A, B, C. Very explicit. I run, uh, I do conferences and program committee all the time for lots of conferences all over the world. If I don't see takeaways for an audience in a session, I will vote it down because it's my responsibility on the program committee to make sure there is value there for my audience. And if I, as a program committee member, can't tell what the value might be, how can I expect my audience to do so? Don't make us read your minds. Be explicit about that. 
And then you probably should know your topic. Um, this is something that you should know reasonably well, well enough to be able to answer questions or at least find answers after the fact. Um, whatever the topic is, make sure it meets this requirement to some extent. You should care about it somewhat, otherwise it will just sort of fall flat. People will know that. So Josh and I did do this survey. And Josh is a data guy. He's now a container guy too, so I guess he puts data in containers. I don't know what it is anymore. But um, So he made beautiful charts for us. We asked people in our survey, you know, what makes a good talk? What do you really enjoy in a conference talk? And if you look here, deep knowledge, energetic speaker. These are numbers two and three on people's preferences. You don't get those by presenting on a topic you don't care about. You can't really be authentic if you don't care about your topic. But if you have this really cool idea and it's really awesome and you really, really want to present on it, this is a conference that you've been meaning to go for years and if you get accepted, then you get to go for free. How cool is that, right? Just because you're not an expert on something, don't let that hold you back. The conference is in six months for crying out loud. You don't have to be an expert in warp course today if you get accepted and to the conference. You do, however, have to be willing to become an expert in six months. We in the biz call this conference-driven development. <laughs> it's, it's a thing. Um, so uh, it's possible, it's totally possible, it's advisable often to make a proposal to a conference even if you're not an expert. And I would say it is very advisable to be a presenter to propose talks, especially when you're not an expert, because this is how you really, really learn things. And also, we get a lot of imposter syndrome. I couldn't possibly talk about automation. How could I do that? Sal is in the audience. Sal is here. I don't, I don't want to talk about automation because I'm not the expert. We well, don't have to be because you still have a lot to add to the story. You don't have to be the foremost expert in something in order to speak about it. So please, propose anyway. So uh, as you're coming up with your ideas, uh, try not to overpromise. try not to underpromise. Be very, very aware of the time slot you have to fill. I'm pretty aware of the fact that I'm going to overrun mine. Um, apologies on that in advance. There are four basic time slots you will see at a lot of conferences. Obviously, there's going to be exceptions. Don't raise your hand and say, oh, well, I saw one, which was 57 minutes. I'll go, yes, I know you did, because they happen. But there are four general types, starting with the really tiny one, the baby one, the wee tiny little one, the lightning talk, the ignite talk, three to five minutes, sometimes 10. I've seen them eight, because people are difficult. Um, a lot of people will tell folks, if you're a new speaker, totally go for a lightning talk. It's great. It's small. It's low investment, right? High speed, low drag, get in, get out. Awesome. You've started your speaking career. I've only ever given one lightning talk in my life because I find them really hard. Don't know if you've noticed, but I talk a lot. It's hard for me to condense things down to three to five minutes. So you do you. If you can be concise and get an idea out there in three to five minutes, great way to get started. Second basic time slot, about 20 to 30 minutes-ish, ish-ish, right? Um, and it's one short topic, one small thing, somewhat in depth, right? You, you're going to go a little more than introductions on these. Third, 45 to 60 minutes, this is my favorite. I like these a lot. I get really weirded out when I have to fit everything into a 30 minute talk. Um, but it's a bigger thing. It's a substantial thing in depth. People should be able to accomplish something new by the end of something this long. Or what I typically do is I give a really high level overview of something huge and introduce people to it and give them the resources they can then use to move forward on their own. And then there's finally the workshop, the tutorial. These are all over the board. You could be 90 minutes like now, half a day, 
had some of those earlier today, whole day. These are all over the place. And this is really getting deep down, dirty, nitty gritty, hands on sort of stuff. Whichever one of these you select, whichever one of these the conference to which you're proposing offers, make sure your topic fits in it. Right? Don't go talking about building your own protocol droid and expecting people to do hands-on in a 20-minute session because you will probably be very disappointed in what happens. Now, as you are coming up with topics in general, you know, obviously the golden rule is going to be appropriate for the audience. What will your audience enjoy? What will your audience get value out of? But there are some other things you should probably keep in mind and not do when you're proposing a talk to a conference. For instance, don't be a sock puppet. If somebody hands you a slide deck and says, hi, go present this at DevWorld, because this is what our company wants you to do, you're just going to be a Muppet up here, right? And you're not going to have the passion. You might have the knowledge, but you won't have the passion necessarily for it. And your audience is going to feel duped. And they're not going to like it, and you're going to get bad ratings, and you'll never be invited back, and we'll drum you out of Melbourne. Please don't bait and switch. As you propose your talk, frequently your talk proposal then becomes the description in the conference catalog. And that's what people use to determine, should I go to this talk or not? And you have now set up a trust relationship with your audience. They trust what they have read is what they're actually going to see. But if you show up and you don't deliver what you promised you would, your audience is going to have their trust violated. They're not going to be very happy. This happens all the time. Oh, I proposed that, but I came up with this other thing, which is close enough, right? It uses the same technology. Well, maybe people don't want to see you're close enough. They want to see what they were promised. So don't bait and switch. And finally, this is tech conferences, right? There are times and places for a sales and marketing pitch. I'm, I, while being a tech person, I am highly business positive. I love marketing in particular. I love sales. Yay, go team. They help me get my salary. Love it. But I'm not going to come up here and do a sales pitch at a tech conference. That's not what people are here for. There's go to the expo hall, go to a, a customer site, do it there, but don't do it at a tech conference. Now, are there any questions about this? Wow. I must be totally crystal clear this time. Either that or you're all bamboozled or on Slack somewhere. Excellent. No sales pitches. Just put that on a shirt somewhere. All right, so moving on. You've got your defined audience. You have an idea, scope to an appropriate time slot. Awesome. Believe it or not, that is the absolute hardest part of this entire process. Um, and it is the most vital. And that's because if you get that wrong, if you screw up that part, then everything which follows after it will be wrong. So you got to get that right. Do take the time to do that work. Otherwise, your talk itself is not going to be very effective. So what happens next is the writing. Well, the first part was really hard and vital. Writing is also hard. I write a lot. My god, it's hard. But um, writing itself is hard. But there are some strategies which can make it, well, not easy, at least less onerous. So. Number one, collect your thoughts in advance. Please do this. Um, it can save you a lot of work because without this step, you're likely to spend a lot of your time doing unnecessary writing and then rewriting and then editing and then re, re, rewriting. Um, so do take the time to collect your thoughts in advance. It's possible some people can fire up their keynote and just start pounding out the slides and go, woo, yeah, I'm awesome, look at this talk, and it might actually work. It doesn't happen often. You are probably not the exception to that particular rule. So it's pretty rare that this is going to be a winning strategy for writing your talk. So do take some time to outline this. But when you outline, when you're preparing and collecting your thoughts, give yourself permission to not do anything structured. Give yourself permission to just let things fall out of your head 
into whatever mechanism you're using to collect your thoughts, right? It doesn't have to have structure. It doesn't have to, it doesn't matter right now if you don't have enough information because I guarantee you won't. It doesn't matter right now if you have too much information because I guarantee you do. It really does go both ways and often at the exact same time, right? Um, so just do a brain dump. You can put it in order later. Now, how do you brain dump these? Where do you collect them? We're technologists. We can solve anything with software. The entire world. We're going to save the world through software. Tell that to Houston. We'll fix their problems right now. So one way to do it is mind mapping software. It's, I, I go back and forth through hi-fi and lo-fi methods, depending upon my mood and my whim that hour. I use MindNode, which is a really great uh, Mac OS software for, for mind mapping. There's also FreeMind, Bubble.us, Scapple, lots of things. Some people like doing this in their Kanban board. You do you. Um, so you can th just randomly put things on cards in Trello and just throw them in your Trello board and just keep piling up the cards. Or you can use lo-fi methods and actual cards. Mind mapping in meat space. Get a big stack of cards or sticky notes. I prefer cards because sticky notes lose the sticky. Um, plus, if my cats walk across them, they accidentally pick up the sticky and then they're dragging cards. <laughs> Which, while adorable, doesn't help your like, mental flow. So, um, you know, just start dumping your ideas into your cards. One idea, one card. One idea, one card. No more than that. Because then you're going to take your cards and you're going to organize them into a physical representation of an outline. You're going to pick this up and move it over there and shuffle that one over there. And as you do this, you'll undoubtedly find that there are cards that just don't really apply. Fine, set them aside. Crumple them up and throw them at your cat. They like that. Um, there are some you will probably find that are missing. Fine, you write them down and you slot them in. And you can just shuffle things around very easily. Whether, regardless of whether you're using hi-fi or lo-fi, once you're done, you can turn everything into an actual outline in your text editor of choice. And this forms the basis of your talk, because now what you have are bullet points, and each bullet point is one idea. And one idea should go on one slide. Now your slides practically write themselves. And it's really a lot easier this way, because you've taken the time to think things through in advance. Now, some people prefer hi-fi, some people prefer lo-fi. I go both ways depending upon my day. But the best system is a system you will use. Don't let anyone tell you there is one way to do this. Don't tell anyone, let anyone tell you that their method is best. The answer is yes, it is best for them. You are not they. So once you've outlined, now you start, have to start arranging your thoughts for your presentation. How do you actually present it to people in a reasonable way, which will keep them engaged somehow? There is something that we do in fiction, which are these seven basic fiction plots. We're not going to use that here. This is just an example because there is a cognate for, for speaking, which are these six basic presentation stories. And you can use these stories as a way to frame your content and create a creative, a, a coherent narrative arc that will pe keep people engaged and allow them to actually absorb your information. Now, I'll go through these really briefly, but remember they're just suggestions. It is possible that your talk doesn't fit into one of these. It is very possible. There's always exceptions to the rule because life is complicated, um, but it's unlikely. So start here and then move on to the more luxurious parts of organization, shall we say. So, catalog. You're looking at a catalog right now. Ten steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Catalog. A list of items with details. Sometimes many more details than necessary. End to end. Beginning to end, top to bottom. Um, here is how I fixed my warp core breach. Discovered the breach, fixed it here. Captain was happy. Yay, go team. Quest, it's a search for a solution. Um, we all have these. I have a 
warp core breach and I don't know how to fix it. How do you discover how to fix your warp core breach? That's your quest. Enlightenment. I started as this primitive person banging a couple of rocks together and I became the chief engineer of a Federation starship. How did I get there? How you can do it too in 10 easy steps. Show and tells, demo. Here's how you break down and rebuild a warp core when all the power is out. And finally, theme and variations. Here's a Romulan warp core. It's a Federation warp core. Here's a Klingon warp core. Let's compare them, contrast. What are good for certain things and what are good for others? Now, here's the content. That's, here's how you tell a story. Here's some just high level ideas to build your story and start crafting it before you actually start making a presentation. You have these questions. Wow, I might end on time. Probably not, I'm talking more than I was earlier today when I practiced. Okay, great, moving on then. There we go. Now, you've got your outline. It's time to start creating your presentation itself. A lot of public speaking articles and books and gurus and thought leader people are going to tell you there is a great one right way to do this. And they are full of blue mud up to their eyebrows. They're wrong. There is no one right, right way to do this. Okay, I'm not, that's not right. The one right way to write your presentation is the one which is going to be best for conveying the information to your audience. You have your audience, you have your talk. The combination of these two things is unique. Only you know how best to communicate your information. Don't go listening to the talking heads who tell you there's only one way to do it. So that means that sometimes the best presentation is no slides at all. There's no requirement saying you have to fire up Keynote and start pounding out those slides. So you can just do a demo you can go all professorial and pull down a whiteboard and start scrawling things out and that could be really cool. Group exercises are quite popular sometimes, um, so that can be good. I have actually seen somebody do a puppet show. Um, I have seen somebody use uh, Tinker Toys before for their talk, explaining Git and Git branching. All right, you don't have to have slides necessarily, but if you do something like say puppets or Lego, do it because it is legitimately the best way to convey your ideas to your audience. If you are talking to a group of seven-year-olds trying to explain the basic concepts of information security, puppets might be a really good way to do it. If you're talking to a group of 40-year-olds about the basics of information security, they might think you are insulting their intelligence if you use puppets. And they might think you're just trying to be a kitschy gimmick. So do use the correct form for your audience. But of course, we all just use slides because that's what we're mostly used to. Um, and this is a really good way. There's nothing wrong with using slides. Look at me using slides. It's fine. Um, you've got Keynote and your PowerPoint and your Google Presenter, whatever it's called now. And if you, are, if you roll with my free software people, then you're using your LibreOffice. Um, so you've got your usual suspects and these get the jobs done quite admirably. But we are in this magical renaissance right now of, of presentation softwares because people got really frustrated with PowerPoint and that's obviously how we got Keynote, right? Now people are really frustrated with Keynote, so they're making new things. Some of these new things are like Prezi, and Remark and, and Reveal.js and Haiku Deck and some are web-based and some are not. What I use is called DeckSet. It is Mac only. It uses Markdown and then turns it into this beautiful thing and I didn't have to lift a finger. It's great. I love DeckSet. It's completely revolutionized how I write and present my talks. But whatever you pick, make sure it suits your needs, right? Unless your company is saying no must use PowerPoint and you must use our templates, right? Unless you've got something like that, and that happens, right? Um, use what works best for you. But do remember, each and every one of these comes with a learning curve. The first time you fire up PowerPoint, your eyes are like spinning counterclockwise and you're like, 
how do I even, I don't know. And then you switch to another one and you have to do it all over again. So do remember there is a learning curve on these. So take your time, don't go jump into a new piece of software three days before your talk. Not the voice of experience at all. So you design. What should things look like? Again, there aren't any rules and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That how you put stuff on your slides, what it looks like, doesn't really matter. Except when you really screw it up or even minorly screw it up. Then it matters a lot. So, you know, the design itself doesn't matter, but the ways you screw it up can. So remember, bottom line, I'm going to keep drilling this in. The best design is the one which effectively presents your information to your audience. That is most important. Not using, Gesundheit, not using your favorite pictures, not using your favorite font, not using your favorite transition, right? That's not important. Only the information. So here's some of the ways you can screw up and things you can consider. Colors. People screw this one up all the time. Please don't get fancy. Fancy is bad. Light on dark, dark on light. I shouldn't have to repeat this and yet I still do. Oh my gosh, these things are good for different things. You know, um, sometimes you don't have this information in advance. You don't know whether you will be in a bright room or a dark room or Tim is going to keep juggling the lights and so you're in both at the same time, right? <laughs> you just don't know that. Um, but the primary goal of all of this is to have something easily readable from across the room from the back of the room, from a distance. Now this is just black and white. There's lots of other colors under the sun. What do you do with them? Well, they also have to be visible from a distance. And this is a solved problem. People figured this out hundreds of years ago as they were standing on the rampart, seeing a crowd of people coming across the field. And are they good or are they bad? Are they here to you know, steal our women and children and our oxen, or are they here to celebrate? You don't know until you can see the banner. And that banner has to be visible from a very long distance, just like your slides. Heraldry solved this a long time ago. Thou shalt not place a medal upon a medal, nor shalt thou ever place a color upon a color. Here's what that means. Yellow and white are medals. Don't put yellow on yellow. Don't put yellow on white. Don't put white on white. Don't put white on yellow. Boom. Look, there's a little graph for it. Um, colors, same thing. Um, what this does, if you followed this really great, really old way of handling colors, is it creates a very strong distinction between your background and your foreground on your slides. It makes it really easy to read from a distance. You know what else it gives you completely for free? That strong distinction between background and foreground helps your audience, the 8% of them who are going to be colorblind. Think about them when you're creating your slides. Make that strong distinction between these things and do like the old folks did and use heraldry. Another thing we screw up all the time because they're really cool. We love playing with colors because it makes it pretty. We love playing with fonts because they're fun. Who doesn't have a huge collection of fonts? We all do, but it can really complicate things on your slides and make it difficult for people to, to focus, particularly if you're constantly switching to new fonts. Your audience is sitting there going, wait, A, that looks terrible, or ooh, I used that one when I was in eighth grade. Um, but they're also thinking, is there some sort of semantics behind which font they're using for which thing? And huh, maybe I can puzzle it out because we're technologists, right? We're going to break the puzzle. There's got to be a puzzle. What they're not doing at that moment is listening to you. They're not absorbing your information. That's because you've made your slides too tricky. So keep it simple. Um, try to have no more than three fonts for these very specific things, titles, text, and code. You know, make them readable from a distance, make them readable at all, as some fonts are not. So I've talked about colors and I've talked about fonts, but what about the actual stuff that goes on the slides? Isn't that important? Yeah, it's a little bit important. Let me tell you a secret, which it took me probably two or three years to figure out. Slides are free. 
Oh my god, did you know you can just like make slides so that it doesn't cost you anything? You can have as many in your presentation as you want. So you can then have less text on each slide. You can have one thought on one slide. And if you're feeling really cheeky, you can spread one thought across multiple slides. <laughs> That's right. And you can do that because slides are free. Don't be afraid to use lots of slides, because if you do, you'll get something like this. Then you'll get purchased by Oracle and disappear. <laughs> so, don't do that. There's too much going on here. This should probably be like 12, 15, 87 different slides. I don't know, definitely not one. Transitions. You probably use Keynote. Most of us use Keynote. I don't anymore. I have jilted it for Dexet. Um, but if you use Keynote, it's got all these shiny bubbles and bells and whistles and doodads, and you just want to play with them all, right? Okay, it's a problem, right? But only do it if it makes sense for your content. Don't do it because it's really cool, unless part of your content is being really irritating. That's, I've seen that done, to good effect, by the way. Uh, if you use transitions, make them consistent because, again, people will try and puzzle out. What's the semantic reason? They think you went left this time and then did the spinny thing that time. And does it mean different things? I don't know. And here comes the anvil, right? You've got to have the anvil. Um, so do be careful with your transitions because they are distracting to people. And if they don't do anything useful and add value to your slides, then you don't need them. This includes animated GIFs. I love animated GIFs. I use them all the time. If you follow me on Twitter, well, if you follow my protected account on Twitter, um, you'll see me constantly tweeting things with GIFs. Problem with that here is it's really distracting. Um, we are evolved from creatures that had to survive through hunting and through not being hunted. Um, so therefore, we are kind of, we're built to see movement and to cue into movement. So if I've got you know, some really cool cat gif up here, you're going to be watching the really cool cat gif because movement, shiny. And what you're not doing, again, is listening to me. Um, and I, I'm, I came all the way from Portland for crying out loud. Please listen to me. Um, so yeah, don't have animated gifs. Or if you do, in Keynote at least, there is a way to have it repeat once and then stop. Um, and that's good, and it's less distracting that way. As you're building your slides themselves, be careful of where you put information on it. Here's a lovely box. It is blue-ish, trust me. Um, so you see this blue-ish box? There's nothing on the edges, including the very top. And that's because in places which are not nearly as nicely set up as this one, these spots on the sides those get cut off all the time by crappy projectors, by small screens. And so you'll lose content if you put it out there. If you put stuff out there, make sure it's not important, right? Because otherwise no one will see it and you lose the value you can provide to your audience. The bottom in particular can be very difficult to see in rooms which are not tiered. Um, so try not to put anything important at the bottom. My Twitter handle is only really important to me, frankly. So I can put it down there. And the licensing, frack, that's also important. So that is presentations. Someone's got to have a question for me now. Yes, what is your name, sir? Thank you. It's more a comment. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I do not take comments. No comments. Done. <laughs> um, if, if, are you going to make it in the form of a question? I will. Are you just doing that to be clever and cute? How do I deal, deal with accessibility? That's an entire talk on its own. I am not good at making my talks accessible. Um, and I am not skilled at this. And it is probably something I need to learn a lot more about. Excellent question. No one's ever asked me that before. Other questions, but not comments, concealed as questions. OK, great. Practice. Writing your talk is one thing. Performing it is another. And make no bones about it. What I am doing up here right now 
is a performance. Every time you stand up in front of a group of people, you are performing. The only way to be successful with a performance is going to be practice, practice, practice. I practiced this talk three times today alone. It's 90 minutes long, people. Okay? You should have seen it, and you can see it because I'll upload the, the video. You should have seen it the first time I did it at 6 a.m. today. Whew, that was rough. Practice is not optional. A lot of people think, hey, I just spent hours and hours writing this thing and crafting my slides. I know this information inside and out. No. No, you are wrong. You have to practice. And that's because writing is not the same as performing. Practicing allows you to become comfortable with speaking the material rather than just thinking it, right? The way I think my speaker notes, it's not the way I'm presenting it to you. It gives you a chance to develop really good habits on posture and on delivery, right? And it makes the process really second nature. And you become confident. And it ensures that things will go much more smoothly because you've actually taken the time to practice. I once was at a talk where a friend was presenting. Um, I think it was on Pearl Six or something like that. It was Amsterdam, I forget. Um, and his MacBook Air slid off and then turned off. It was very exciting. He kept going. He was able to keep going as he uh, was rebooting his machine and bringing Keynote back up and finding the right slide. And it worked. It was great. He, like, consummate pro. I was sitting there going, I want to be you when I grow up. I mean, it was just amazing. Um, but it's because he practiced and he knew his stuff and he was really confident. So when we did that survey, Josh and I, we asked people, if you had a magic wand and you could expunge one bad thing from speakers, one thing that could just disappear forever, what would it be? Huge margin, like twice as many votes as any other one, was unpracticed and unprepared presenters. So if you don't practice, your audience knows and they don't like it. And you're doing this for them. So if for no other reason than that, do practice. We've all been there. We've been in a talk where somebody has thrown their, you know, sun microsystem slide up there and proceeds to read through it, right? Um, that mostly is a flaw in the writing because they have too much on their slide. But the presenting equivalent of that is to put everything in your speaker notes and then give a dramatic reading of those notes. This is a crutch for those who don't know their material well enough. I am actually reading my notes right now. Um, so it is a crutch for people who don't know their material. They will put everything and write an entire essay in their, their notes, and that's great. I have that myself. Am I looking at my notes? No, because I've practiced. Speaker notes are a great thing. Not just for me up here so I can keep track of what I'm supposed to be saying and not go too far off base, which I'm really likely to do, but um, it adds context to people when you export your slides, everybody always asks, are your slides available? Your slides available? Well, yeah, but okay, if you want that, fine. But it, when I export my speaker notes, it actually means something. So speaker notes are great, but don't read them. Practice your talk instead. Now, there are right ways to practice, and there are wrong ways to practice, and we all love a train wreck, so let's start with the wrong ways to practice. Now. A lot of people will say they're practicing if they're sitting there going through their slides. Click, click. I'm reading them through in my head. I'm practicing, right? No. You are becoming more familiar with the material, and that's really valuable. I do this on planes all the time because I'm on planes all the time. Um, but this doesn't help you with presenting it. The way you emote in your head is completely different than out loud completely different. So don't do this. Right way to practice is to practice as you will be performing. How will you be doing that? Will you be standing up in front of people, giving a talk? That's the best way to practice. Find a meetup. People at meetups love when you come to them and say, hey, so I have this talk, would you mind me? Oh my god, yes, because they can't find enough speakers. They love it when you come to them and offer to do a presentation. Um, but if you don't have 
a local meetup where you can present your specific talk. Say there is no, you know, IOS or developer meetup in your group in your community. You could form one, by the way. But if there isn't one, maybe you have some friends whom you can owe some beers um, and who are not too critical, who will listen to you and give you legitimate feedback. They don't even have to give you feedback, they just have to be there. Go, hi TK, would you listen to me? Cool. Cool. Excellent. Um, if you don't have friends available who just can't, their schedules don't meet up or something like that, it does help to have a face there. So use a mirror if you want. I don't like this one. I nickel and dime myself too much and get really self-conscious. But you can use your pets, your hamster. Talk to your hamster cage. Believe me, they don't mind. Your dog. Your dog loves to hear you talk. That's what dogs do. Don't use your cat. They're way too critical. <laughs> so don't, don't do the cat. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't matter, right? Just do your presentation as though you are in front of a bunch of people. And please record yourself. Every time I say this, people are like, I can't. I just can't listen to myself. I can't see myself on Twitter. Oh, 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 make it go away. Um, I used to be that way. And to be honest, I still am that way. But then I got the hell over myself. And watching my talks, watching my videos, re going through them has made me a much better speaker in a shorter time. Because I am the most critical person I know for myself. And I will nitpick the crap out of myself. And you know what I do now? I create a GitLab issue. And I list everything I want to fix. And then I go in and I fix them all because all of my presentations are in source control, as should be yours. It's another slide, actually. Another really great benefit of practicing is that it exposes the flaws in your writing. I write all the time. And I'm pretty good at it, I like to think. But I don't get it right every single time. I definitely never get it right the first time. So there are wordings which don't work. There are transitions which just don't, I know, transit. Right? So you've got to figure this out. And the best way to do that is to run through the material a few times. Usually best. By the way, if you uh, practice for comfortability and editing purposes first, become comfortable with the material, fix your, your editing and your flow of things, and afterwards, work on hitting your times. That's because if you're timing yourself right from the get-go, um, then what you're going to be doing is timing something that's going to be moving. You're going to be editing and shifting it, and your times probably won't work the next time you do it. So try and do timing later, do editing first. This is where most people screw up a lot of their talks, and that is in the transition and the flow of the content. Transitions matter. If you saw that GitLab uh, issue, the vast majority of it is transition between 21 and 22. Add notes for 15. Transition between section 5 and section 6. Because my transitions really sucked the last time I did this, so I fixed those. Um, as you do this, don't be afraid of refactoring your talk. You know, to smooth out the transitions, add in some new slides, completely change the wording on things. Because that's what this, this is the opportunity for you to do that. And you can't tell if you don't practice. And then you do have timing. Use a timer when you are doing your talks. Um, most new speakers I know will hit both ends of the timing spectrum, by the way. They will, at the very start, they will go way over in time because they've got too much information that they're trying to fit into their 50 minutes. And then they have to cut a lot of stuff. Um, but during performance, they're so nervous and they're speaking so quickly that they get there really fast. Um, so they hit both sides of it. If you practice, however, you discover how much content you can fit in your time. So you can fix that and you become comfortable with it. And you're more confident. And you're not going to speak a mile a minute here. Um, this actually is the timing I had for when I went through my video from last time I did this here at DevWorld. This is the bottom of that GitLab issue there. Um, so uh, as you're practicing, once you get to the timing part, uh, if it's something longer like this, try and break it up into pieces and then just practice that piece and set the time. This section has to be only 10 minutes long. 
practice, practice, practice until you can nail it at nine minutes and 50 seconds. And then do it again to make sure it wasn't an accident. And do that for all the sections and then put them together to make the sure, sure the transitions flow. Look, you've got a great talk now that flows really well and hits your time. When you perform, use a timer function on your software or on your iPhone. Um, and then you can put your times and your speaker notes. You can go, okay, right now I'm supposed to be at 13 minutes. Yep, okay. Um, I'm at, actually supposed to be at 13 minutes and I'm way over time, so it doesn't matter. Now, practice. Are there any questions on practice? Tim, yes. Uh, so recording your talks is really hard. How do you do it? Great question. I have a blog post for that. Um, how do I do? It's thanks to our marvelous Tony. Is Tony in the room? And Dev World last year. I use Keynote um, now, and I record all of my talks. Um, are we all waiting? Hi. Uh, um, I record all of my talks uh, using a screencast in Keynote. And then I usually get them posted to Internet Archive faster than the conference can get them posted to YouTube or whatever folder all they're using. Um, and that allows me to practice more quickly. It means I am guaranteed to have a video because I can't rely on most free and open source software conferences to do it because they're volunteer run. And if you get a video, it might be six months in the future. I guarantee I've got it. And I've got the content and I can share it with people. But yeah, I've got a blog post on my blog. You can go to vmbrisor.com, click on the little anonymous hash thing, look for recording your talks. Um, there's also something there on how to upload them to Internet Archive. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Any other questions? Yes, sir, what's your name? Luke. Hi, do Luke. you record when you're practicing? Or do you just do it when you're... Um, once you've actually done the talk? Good question. Do I record when I'm practicing or only when I'm doing the talk? Until recently, it was only when I was doing the talk. Um, but I've been having a really strong focus lately on helping new people uh, get into speaking. Um, not just with this, but in general, I, I do a lot of mentoring and helping people do this. Um, and I thought, well, they don't see the process. They see me standing up here and doing an okay job of what I do, but they don't see how I got there. So now I am recording the, the practices, and I'm putting them at Internet Archive, and where I put my slides and this screencast that I'm taking right now, by the way. So if you want to see how the sausage is made, and you want to hear me swearing a lot, then you should go watch the videos. But don't watch them right now because they're not uploaded because I'm in Australia, and what the hell with your internet, guys? Goodness. Um, but once I get to Tasmania, where I will have NBN, I will get them uploaded probably on Thursday. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions? Yes, sir, what's your name? Ben. Pardon? Ben. Ben, hi, Ben. So Ben's question, <laughs> thank you. So Ben's question is, do I recommend repeating the question uh, uh, from the audience members? And the answer is yes. And the answer also is, I've got another slide for that further on. So got you covered, Ben. OK, I'm going to move on now with present yourself. Um, so you've got your talk written. You've practiced the dickens out of it. Now you have to perform it. You have to stand up here and do this thing, right? This is one of those, like, the real performance was inside yourself all along sort of moments. And that's because how you present yourself has a massive impact how your performance is received. It makes a big difference. So what are the things you can do? What are some of the things you can do to maximize that impact? Well, number one, look at people. Make some eye contact. Um, now, a lot of these things in this particular section, section number six, with Madonna on the front, isn't she lovely, um, are psychological in nature. 
And this is one as well. We trust people who will look us in the eye. So if you make eye contact with people, then they're more likely to trust you. And they know that you're paying attention to whether they're paying attention. Um, so do allow your eyes to kind of float around the room and look at people and you know, say, oh, that's a cute dress and stuff like that. But what you shouldn't do is you probably shouldn't just like stare at one person. Because it's kind of creepy and a little awkward for everyone. <laughs> so, so please don't do that. Don't just look at your friends. Do look at your friends. They're there to support you. You know, look at them from time to time. They'll be like, yay, yay, and they give you a little thumbs up. Yay, Paul, right? Um, so do look at your friends. Don't avoid them. You know, they're part of your audience as well. But don't just look at them. A lot of people will do this when they're new speakers because, again, they're, you're all strangers here. I don't want to look at strangers. No, you're not strangers. We're all friends. So I'm going to look at all of you. Finally, don't just look at your laptop. And again, do the speaker reading dramatic notes sort of thing. It shows I'm not prepared. And it really looks bad for you. This is not exciting at all. Body language is great. So much brilliant psychological stuff about this. Now, studies have shown that we trust people more. If they take a more open stance. You know, you've got swooping but not like ostentatious arm movements. Um, your shoulders are back, your chest is open and expanded. Your feet are shoulder width apart and your head is up. Yay, your chin is up. You're actually looking at people. Theories are that we trust people like this because an open stance is a vulnerable stance. I'm vulnerable up here in front of all of you. I trust you enough to be vulnerable, and therefore, you trust me back. Isn't that great? Isn't that lovely? We're all friends here, right? Um, people who are hostile or have bad intentions towards you, they're going to hide a bit more. They'll be hunched over. They could be hiding a weapon. You don't know. But you're not going to trust them if they do this. So stand up. Open up a bit, and people will like you more. They'll be more engaged with your presentation. <clears throat> Speaking of engaged, we are more drawn to friendly people. We are more drawn to people who smile sincerely at us. We like that a lot. And we trust them more. Now this has to be a sincere smile. Can't be one of those fake, hi, yes, auntie, go ahead and kiss me yet again. Right? It can't be one of those. It has to be legit. You can't have a legitimate smile if you're up here really, um, you know, kerfuffled and I'm not feeling confident about my talk and I really don't like this material very much either and what the hell is up with the internet in Melbourne? You know, if, so you have to be happy to be here or at least not be sad because legitimate smiles really do matter. If you watch videos of speakers who do this a lot, I might be one, Paul is definitely one, Watch his videos. He's really great at this. He moves around. Sorry, Paul, to pick on you. Yeah, um, he moves around a lot, yeah? Um, and it's great. It's really engaging and energetic to watch. Great speakers do this all the time. They're very mobile. They're not hiding behind the podium. You know what hiding behind a podium looks like? Like you're all hunched over and you're hiding a weapon and something could happen. So get out there in front of your people. And by in front, I mean actually face front as well. I have turned around a couple of times to like point things out and go, wow, that really is still huge. Um, but in general, I'm facing you. And if I'm facing you, you can trust me because I'm looking at you. It all sort of rolls downhill and collects into a big ball of trust and like. It's great. Now, recording yourself allows you to find some of these bad habits that you might have. The first time I watched one of my own talks, years and years and years ago, I discovered that I used to stand there like this. One leg and I'd be talking along and I used to do this at the office. I had a standing desk at the office and so I just got into the habit. One foot back and forth. I got into the habit of doing this and I was doing that in my presentation. And you know what? It was distracting as hell. <laughs> but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't watched my talk. Guess what? I don't stand on one foot anymore. 
because I watch my talk. So a lot of this body language and voice stuff is very, very well covered in theater resources. So I don't have any theater resources for you, but if you want to learn more about it, seek them out or find your local thespian and ask them about this and they would love to talk about it. Um, so I'm not going to cover that sort of stuff today, but I want you to know that there is more information out there on this. Now, <clears throat> remember when I said that uh, unpracticed or unprepared speaker was like the number one thing people wish they could expunge from the face of the earth? The number two thing was could not hear or understand the speaker. Now, it's possible you can't understand me because I'm American and I apologize for that. <laughs> but aside from that, there are some things which you can do to fix. I can't fix being American, um, but there are otherwise things you can do. Are you projecting at all? I have my microphone on, but frankly, I probably don't need one. Um, won't be able to speak tomorrow, but I won't need one. Are you, if, you're not, if you're not projecting, you might not be standing tall enough. You might, might be doing one of this. It actually is really difficult to project when not only are you scrunched over and you know, squinching your lungs, but I'm not even pointing the right direction. So stand tall and you project better. Are you mumbling? If you're mumbling, it's probably that you are, you're not well practiced and you're vocally hiding rather than speaking up. Practicing more helps mumbling more than so much other stuff. You might find some tricks that people will tell you to do, and I'm sure some of these theater books will tell you that, but practicing helps so much with mumbling. My personal pet peeve for all talks. So many speakers will stand in front of the crowd and have absolutely no inflection in their voice. Um, it is quite literally monotonous, it is very, very dull, and you just will fall asleep. Um, it sends a signal to the audience that you're not excited by the material, and frankly, neither should they be. <laughs> so put some emotion into your talk. You know, don't just go monotone on people. Pretend you actually like it at least. Again, you should like it, but pretend you like it a lot. Put some emotion and inflection into your performance. Get excited and show it. I'm not talking like, you know, balmer levels of excitement up here. <laughs> We're not dance, monkey boy, dance, but do add some emotion. God, my tweets are going to be bad after this, aren't they? <laughs> uh, for the record, I never know what I actually say until I check my Twitter afterwards and I see what Tim has retweeted. And I'm like, man, did I say that? Yeah, Vicky. Oh. Um, and the final one, um, so there's this thing that people, I know they, they like sometimes, you know, they do it all the time, but they do it in regular conversation for crying out loud. You need to be authentic up here. If you normally um, then you will probably um during your presentation and that's okay. Don't get your knickers in a twist. It's totally fine to um up here. You have my permission to um and have vocal tics during your talk. <clears throat> um, there's nothing wrong with it. Ooh, see, just did it. Demo, live demo. Uh, so it's okay to do it. They're not as big of a deal as everybody says they are. Um, my friend uh, Randall calls these a cash misfire, right? And you know what you do if you've got a cash misfire? You refill your cash. You know how you refill your cash when you're going to do a performance? You practice. And if you practice, you'll have considerably fewer of these vocal tics. They'll still be there because, again, we're authentic. We're real people. We're going to say, um, or, uh, well, hmm. We're going to do that, and that's okay. Be a real person on the stage. Be you. You do you, honey. And never, never apologize for being a new speaker. I will verbally spank you if I ever hear you doing this. You have taken a lot of time to craft this story and to practice your performance, right? To present yourself. If you take that time, if you invest it, I guarantee that not only will you have the confidence of an experienced speaker, but you are going to be better than 70, 80, 90% of them out there because they didn't take that time. They rest on their laurels. They're like, I'm a name. I don't have to practice. I don't have to be good. 
they're full of shit. So don't apologize for being inexperienced. If you say nothing, odds are really good your audience is never going to notice. If you say something, they're instantly going to be cluing in on every little thing you might possibly do wrong. And even worse, some of them after the fact are going to be really helpful and give you advice on how to be better. When really they're just being jerks. So, never forget, if you are where I am, I don't care if it's your first talk, I don't care if it's your 181st talk, you earned your place on that stage. Full stop. Never apologize for being kick-ass at what you do. Never do that. Now, are there any questions? Yes, sir, what's your name? Uh, Frank. Fred? Frank, hello, Frank. Hi. Um, do you have any tricks in your toolbox for when you can see in the audience that your presentation is running off the rails? <laughs> do I have tricks in my toolbox for when my presentation is running off the rails? Um, is it now? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't, actually. I, uh, the one time my presentation went off the rails, it's because I finished it 30 minutes before I had to present, and I had no time to edit or do anything, and oh my god, it was a train wreck. It was terrible. Um, but it's never happened since then because I, I got burned so badly that I learned a lot. So I don't have any tricks, but now I think I need to go find some. Thank you. Is this presentation about those tricks? What's your name, sir? Bart, hello Bart. Is this presentation about those tricks? No, this, this is about crafting something to make sure it doesn't fuck up in the first place, right? But if you do all this work and you still somehow misjudge your audience and you haven't gotten the appropriate information and it just like <laughs> totally falls flat, what do you do? I probably would do my darndest to just get through it <laughs> and just make it over as quickly and as efficiently and professionally as possible. But I probably need a better strategy for that. Uh, yeah, sometimes I, I give talks and I'll see people drifting off. It. Mm. It and that's different. No, I've that's different. The room was at 25 degrees. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a different thing. If, uh, yeah, so what he said is that sometimes he'll see people drifting off and he realized that the room was at 25 degrees. God, that would be horrid. But it happens. More often they're too cold, frankly. Um, no, if people drift off, it happens. People have laptops open, and nobody's really listening to me. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Um, okay, so let me get going, because the next session is, is longer than I would like, and we're already going longer than I would like. And that's demos. Um, how do you do a demo? Um, why do you do a demo? Why, why would you put yourself through doing a demo? Well, there are some legitimate reasons. I don't have any, except for this. This entire talk is one live demo. Give it up, yeah. Um, so uh, you would demo to prove that something works at all. Um, this is really good if you've got investors, you wanna do that. Um, to inspire people. This is easy, anyone can do it. Look, let me show you, la la la. Uh, it can help you structure your presentation really well. If in your proposal you promised you were going to demo something, don't do a bait and switch. Demo something. Do what you want. Um, and then some people enjoy it. Josh really loves doing demos. I think he's mad as a hatter, but he loves it. So, you know, he makes sure he has demos in all of his presentations. But why would you not do a demo? Well, really, if you don't need to, why put yourself through that? And why put your audience through that? If you don't have anything to demo, don't bother. Um, a lot of people won't demo because they're afraid of failing. It turns out, frankly, most audiences don't care if your demo falls flat. They just don't care. Frankly, I believe it's because they're just used to it. Demos fail all the time. Um, but if your demo is going to fail and you're there presenting for your employer and you're presenting their software, I recommend you not demo because your employer is going to be really pissed as you fall flat on your face with their shiny new software in front of however many people. So there are really good reasons not to demo there. Uh, demos can take a lot of time that might detract from other content you have to present. So you don't always have to demo if you've got other things to do. <clears throat> 
And really, the audience doesn't care. Here is our magical chart again. Not a graph, it's a chart. So I was corrected earlier. So you see down here, we have exercises and demo are some of the least important things to your audience member. They don't care. So if you don't have to do it, why put all the extra effort into it? But sometimes you do have to do it. And when you do, there are multiple kinds of demos you can uh, try. The very first one it happens most often, and that's just showing some code. Um, it's the easiest one and the one I will cover most today because it's the one people do really badly. <clears throat> And then there's show and execute. La la la, here's some code. Boom, look, it works. Ha ha ha. And then you can build something completely from scratch and execute. And I don't know if you were at DevWorld last year, but we had that in one of our keynotes, which was just completely mad. I don't understand how they did that. Um, so, showing code. Again, people do this really badly. This is the most common demo. Um, Fortunately, most of the problem is totally with formatting and not the code itself. I don't care about your code, whether it's ugly or not. I do care whether it's ugly, um, whether it works. You can just paste that into your slide software, and some slide software will do a good job of that. Others will not. So be very careful with that. It could be that you've got a lot of code, and it doesn't make sense to go pasting it into all these slides. So instead, you can fire up your Xcode, and you can show it in there. Or if you're like kicking it old school, you can go to your command line right, and fire up your Vim or Emacs or whatever it is you happen to use. The key to all of these is they have to be readable. How do you make your code readable? <clears throat> Number one, use a monospace font. I don't know of any programmers who don't program in a monospace font, but I've seen plenty of them drop something into their slide software and have it show it in like Times New Roman or something like that. Right. Um, so do convert it to a monospace font. If your, your uh, software will do syntax highlighting, turn it on, but do make sure it is readable and it's not doing any of that, you know, metal on metal or color on color sort of thing. Um, light backgrounds often are better according to Josh's studies. I think he's full of crap because it makes my eyes bleed to see something this huge and white in front of me, but whatevs. Um, he actually did the studies and found that it's better. And try to align things to make it easy for people to read. Because you're standing back there as I'm up here talking about code, and you're trying to like skim it really quickly. And if it's hard for you to skim, then you're going to be keep doing that and puzzling it out, again, and not focusing on what I'm saying. So do align it. <clears throat> Here's an example of some bad code. Um, there's way too much on here because, frankly, all I want to show is this. But I'm going to be useful and helpful, and I'm going to give you all this content up here, right? Um, but I, I just want you to see that. So there's too much on there, and the text is way too small. Um, the code here is not aligned, which just sort of gives my anal retentive brain the heebie-jeebies anyway. Um, this is really long and it makes the code or the text smaller and harder to read. So this needs fixing. And here, here, aha, click the right button. Here's some better code. It's really huge. It's easier to read. Um, these all line up so you can very quickly skim down and see what they say. All right? So this is better code. It's easy. Whatever you do, make your text big enough. This is like cardinal sin number one for developers as they're showing code. It's tiny little code and expect everyone to read it. That doesn't work. So here's a lot of code. Josh uh, is a Postgres core developer, so he likes SQL. He wrote our code samples. So we have a kind of medium length SQL statement. Um, this is not easy to read. but Let's say I'm going to walk through it. So I can snippet this code. And I can talk about this little piece here. And you can see I've excerpted pieces of the code, which I can then put on further slides and tell you about the spectacular, fabulous, long minutes left outer join nonsense that I'm doing here. Um, and then I can add that final bit. There's a lot to this final bit, really, but all I really want you to focus on is this. 
So you can snippet your code and break it into smaller pieces across multiple slides because again, slides are free. Then highlight it and make it easier for people to note what you want them to see. But the bottom line is, code which people can't see, they can't read, it's not a useful piece of code in a presentation. Speaking about not being able to see or read it, remember our friend the box. When you're doing a demo, try to keep it in the box, if at all possible. Um, you can use your command history to uh, prevent typos on things in your terminal if you're doing that. <clears throat> try and use a white background. Again, Josh is smoking mad crack. But hey, you do you, honey. If you are doing something in the terminal, if you are doing something in Xcode, anything like that, before your demo starts, before you plug in this little HDMI cable, fix your font size. Because a number of times I've seen people doing this. Plus, 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 oh, shit, minus, plus, plus. Can, can you read that? Is, is that readable from? Whatever, I gotta go now. So, um, no, fix it up front. If you do that, I guarantee everyone in the room is gonna go, whoa, she's a pro. She didn't have to change her font size. So just do it up front, it's so easy. Um, as you're doing this, demos are prone to failure. Happens all the time. So you can minimize risks in your demos. If you're gonna do them at all, make them survivable. Don't be ambitious and do some huge complicated thing. Test it on this hardware, right? The one you're presenting from. Don't think just because it works in a Docker container on your computer at work that it's gonna work on a Docker container here. Docker says it does and it doesn't always. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> um, don't expect to have internet. A lot of places will have special internet up here just for you special speaker person. Don't rely on it, and certainly never be foolish enough to rely on conference Wi-Fi. Um, and don't do a cascading demo. Cascading demo is when you have four demos, one, two, three, four, and they all rely upon each other. They build on each other's backs, and it's really impressive when it works, but when cascading demo number one, or two, or three fails, where does that leave you for the rest of them? You're kind of screwed. So try not to do them if you can help it. But if you do have to do them, there's nothing saying it has to be live. You can do a fake demo. It's okay. We're not going to shame you and put you in a corner. Um, this decreases your risk a lot. And if you fake a demo, you decide to do a live demo, you can have a fake one in your pocket and go, oh, well, that didn't work. Here, look at this. And then you can keep moving. And then again, everyone's like, whoa, she's a pro. So how do you fake a demo? Screenshots, those qualify as a demo, ladies and gentlemen. You can take a video or a screencast of the software actually doing what you want it to do. Um, you can record your sh shell session and just put it on autopilot and stand back and go, yeah, I'm badass. Um, interactive shell scripts, same sort of thing. If you rely on internet, uh, there's a recent article on opensource.com, man wrote on how to fake it out with a squid proxy and fake out your internet and have a live demo totally on your hardware. So if your internet dies, you can just set everything up. I think that was published about three weeks ago on opensource.com. Just look for squid. Really, that word doesn't happen a lot in open source, so it'll be easy to find. But inevitably, if you do demos, one's gonna fail. And I gotta say, it's okay. This does happen all the time. It's only a big deal if you make a big deal out of it. If you're like, well, we'll just get back to that later. Moving on to the next topic. Everyone's going to forget it. If you start like going into this, Derek's and going, oh my God, no, just, I got this, it's okay. Your audience will remember that, I guarantee. But they'll otherwise forget. So do be prepared for failure on your demo. Have a backup plan of content. And if nothing else, be prepared. So are there any questions on demos? Okay, good. I'm going to move forward because we're over time. Interacting with the audience. You have beautiful people, each and every one of you are lovely, out here to listen to me for some mad reason. Um, 
So I want to interact with you. Number one, in interacting with the audience. This is a performance, and I am in control. I am driving the bus, I have to keep my hands on the wheel, or it's going to go off the road and hit someone. So, I have to remain in control up here. Don't let your audience take the wheel of the bus. Before your talk starts, how do you interact with people? Well, you can start kibitzing with them. Um, I do this a lot. When you're setting up, you can just ask people, hey, where'd you come from? Where'd you come from? You don't have to be smarmy like that. Um, but chatting with them it helps you become familiar with your audience and to your audience. And it breaks the ice before you start your performance. You've already spoken with your audience now. They're not strangers, they're friends. Okay? Another good thing to do as people come in, as you're setting things up, ask them to come down. Hey, could you like come down to kind of the front a bit? Um, often people won't do this, and that's fine. Don't be a dick about it. Um, but, but do ask them to come down. There's actual reasons for this. That's because it's better for you and your confidence to be presenting to a more consolidated group of people. It's just easier for you to do it as a performer. But also, if there are people scattered all over the place, like if this block of folks were some over there and some over there and some over there, it actually makes the space look quite empty. And that's a blow to your ego. And you don't need that, especially if you're relatively early on in your speaking career. So ask folks to come down, join us up here. Look, there's a seat. Um, and if they don't want to, that's fine. Let them sit wherever they want. Sometimes during your performance, you will ask for some sort of response, for your audience to chime in, like, hey, raise your hand if you've ever had a warp core breach. Right? Or um, who knows what this picture is of this? You know, and just sort of ask for some sort of response. With some audiences, they take this as an opportunity to start a freeform dialogue. Um, this quickly leads to your performance getting out of control, and you can't do that. So you can do these instead. Only take answers from people who raise their hands. If you ask them to raise their hands and they don't raise their hands, they're, they're, they get detention, right? They're not behaving well. You can also phrase it hypothetically and just not take respondents at all. Raise your hand if you've ever had a warp core breach. Yeah, of course, we all have, right? Don't give people a chance to give you a response. Just move on. And finally, if you do take free form responses, then you're in command. You get to say, wow, that was really great. Those are great ideas. Thank you. If you have more, bring them up after the session. We have to move on now. You must be in control, right? And you have to be the one to say, we are moving on. Jokes are fun. We love jokes. It can be a really effective way to, to engage with your audience. And that's because when people laugh, it releases lovely things that make them like you more. And as a presenter, you like that. You want people to like you. That's why I'm up here, to try and convey information. And if you don't like me, you're going to toot me off and just spend all your time on Twitter. So as effective as jokes can be for you to be engaging with your audience, they're also equally effective at offending your audience. So if you are not 100% sure that your joke is safe, if you're not 100% sure that your joke is going to knock it out of the park, then please reconsider having that joke at all. It's much better than risking offending your audience. Don't do that. Most sessions will have some sort of Q&A aspect to it, although in a lot of free and open source software conferences lately, they've, they've, there's this trend to not have Q&A. Um, but as a speaker, you can override that. You can have whatever Q&A you want or not. It's up to you. You're driving the bus. Now, where do you put that? Usually, I have it all saved to the end. And that's because I'm easily distracted by you wonderful, beautiful people and your brilliant ideas. So save it for the end. But I can't do that here. Right? It doesn't make any sense for me to be saying, hey, so about that story arc thing. You want to save that question for the end? No, that has to be after section three. So it's interspersed here. Um, when you ask for questions, sometimes you'll get a lot of people putting their hands up. Spread that love around, not just among people, but among parts of the room. Make sure everyone knows they will have an opportunity to be heard. This is important. 
Um, and do, hey, oh, Ben took off. Um, do repeat the questions. Absolutely. Now, a lot of people say, do this for the video. Because otherwise, often the questions aren't picked up on the video. And they hear you answering some completely vague, context-free thing. That is rather confusing. But the reason I say you should repeat the question is to make sure you actually understood it. Because often people will just go off in their little world. I'm answering a question that you didn't actually answer, ask. Right, so make sure that you repeat it for that reason and for no other. And something that I think I might be the only person doing, but I'm starting to, I want this to trend, man. Um, ask for the questioner's name. Now, most people don't do this for, I don't know, what reason. I started doing it um, because I need further, I, I, I've, I'm up here doing this thing, right? And you are people in the audience. You are people with needs and wants and problems to be solved. If I ask your name, you're no longer an audience member. You are a name. You are a person. And that helps me remember that there are real people at the end of what I do. And it's really important for me to do that. However, full disclosure, I've already forgotten all of your names. Except for Ben. Um, I'm t I've got mine like a steel sieve, you know, and so I don't remember names very well. It's nothing personal, but I will directly look at your badge all week. <sighs> Yay, my favorite part. Um, so sometimes you have problems with your audience. Happens all the time. This is what most new presenters are really worried about. And it's nothing to worry about. It's fine. Just keep your hands on that wheel. Um, often people will ask you questions like, hey, how do you do this? And I'm like, huh, I don't know. Totally fine. It's cool to say, I don't know. Also cool to say, I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you. Come up after the session and get me your contact information. There is no shame in not knowing everything under the sun. It's okay to say, I don't know. Um, sometimes you offend your audience with that poorly placed joke. The moment you realize it, I don't care if it's five minutes later, I don't care if it's after the fact, you apologize very publicly and very clearly and say, wow, did I really say, God, I am so sorry. I, I didn't realize that would be offensive. I've learned now, I am sorry, I am sorry, I am sorry and then move on. But you do it right that moment that you recognize you have offended. Don't think you can save this for social networking later and say, oh, sorry, <laughs> drop bears, ha ha ha. Right, no, don't do that. Um, and then finally, the one that everybody is really worried about, and those are the disruptive audience members. Uh, there's two of these primarily. There's the guy in the third row. You don't have, oh, we have one guy in the third row up here. Um, uh, and apologies, gentlemen, but it is always a man. <laughs> so it is the guy in the third row. This is not an androgynous guy. This is definitely a male guy. Sorry, it's the thing. So you've got the guy in the third row. It's the guy who is constantly interrupting you while you're presenting. It's the guy who asks really dumbass questions. It's the guy who wanted to be up here but wasn't good enough to do it. That's the guy in the third row. And then there is the person who has a story. During Q&A time, they will hold forth on their favorite subject, which may have nothing to do with what you discussed, by the way. Or they will tell you in great detail the thing which you very explicitly pointed out you were not going to discuss in your talk. And this was a problem you really should have talked about. Their favorite pet technology and library. Um, and sometimes it's just people who, I'm sorry to use you as an example, but who just have a comment rather than a question. Um, now this is fine, you do, you, do, you do what you want to do. I don't allow question, or comments during my question time because it very easily can get out of hand. Um, and people are not here to see folks in the audience speak. They're here to see me. So I don't allow comments in my talks. Um, when this happens, it is disrespectful for you as a speaker. It's disrespectful of you to your audience to allow this to continue to happen. 
Your entire audience is here to get something done, to learn something. If there is a disruptive audience member, can they learn anything? No. And they are really uncomfortable right now with this asshat butting in all the time. And they would like, gosh, I just I wish he would shut up. It's your responsibility as the speaker to make that person shut up. You have to be firm about it, but be empathetic. Don't be a dick. Stopping assholery with assholery does not actually stop assholery. It just makes for more assholes. So don't be a jerk about it. Let people know that they will be heard. They just don't have to be heard right then. Right? So say, hey, wow, that's really, I mean, don't be like, yo, cool story, bro. No, you, wow, that's really interesting. Um, we don't have the time to cover that right now. Please come up afterward and we will discuss it. But we need to go, we need to continue right now. And be firm, but empathetic and polite about it. Sometimes they'll continue. And if they do, you, it's your responsibility to find a polite way to ask them to please leave. And if they won't, then it's your responsibility to speak to the room proctor and say, Tim, could you help me? And Tim will be a good man and help solve the situation. So, but don't be afraid to ask the baddie to leave because it's respectful to the rest of your audience who are there to get something done. Now, any questions on audience members and interacting with them? If not, I'm going to move forward. Awesome, okay. So, before you speak, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, most of these are pretty self-evident, so hopefully I'll be able to blaze them pretty quickly. About a week before, Check the schedule of the conference, because all it takes is one speaker having a family emergency and the entire schedule gets juggled. And maybe you'll have to shift your flights. Who knows? These things happen. So check the schedule, make sure that it's still happening at the same time. While you're there at the schedule, check a couple more things. Make sure that it's actually the right length of talk that you're expecting, um, because otherwise you show up with a 50 minute talk and it's a 30 minute slot and then you're really kind of screwed and you have to redo your talk at the last minute. Um, check the description to make sure you're not gonna do a bait and switch. <sighs> Look for opposing talks on that schedule. Um, if you are up against a popular speaker, there's nothing you can do about it. Do not go asking to be rescheduled. That's bad mojo, don't do that. But what you can do is to possibly do more promotion of your talk, to try and lure a couple more people into your talk rather than say PJFs. Um, when you're up against PJF, you're not going to get a big audience. It's good for you to know this in advance because then when you do have only five or six people in your room, you're able to say, it's not me. It's that I'm up against another speaker. It's scheduling. It's not personal. Because if you don't know that in advance, you can feel really low. It's like, oh, nobody likes my stuff. And that comes across in your presentation. So know this in advance. Um, and finally, if you need special equipment, if you have two speakers, for instance, and you need two microphones, if you need audio out, this is the time to write the organizers and make sure they remember that you asked for a second microphone in your room. Because that's not the sort of thing you want to learn the day of your presentation, that they forgot it. So the day or so before, um, double check the schedule because things change at the last minute all the time. If you're at the conference, have a look at the room. Don't do what I did and walk in and go, whoa, wasn't it orange last year? Um, I mean, I was really weirded out when I first walked in here. Um, check the projector. Plug your actual presentation machine into your actual room projector if you can. If not, a lot of conferences have speaker lounges. Those speaker lounges often will have a projector there for just that purpose, to make sure that your nice laptop will speak nicely to the nice projector. Because that, again, is not something you want to learn when you're standing up here trying to set up. Um, if you have backup slides, do you have backup slides? You do now because you just made some and you put them in iCloud and Dropbox and GitLab and GitHub and get it ready. I don't care. Just put as many of them in as many places as possible because should I accidentally dump water all over this and I can't use my computer anymore, which by the way has kind of happened to me before. I was at a conference once and a friend came walking up to me, brand new MacBook Air. I was so excited, it's super light, awesome. He walked up and he gave me this huge hug and he knocked my coffee all over my MacBook. It was very traumatic. 
Um, we got it working, it was fine, but um, thankfully I had backup slides just in case and about a billion and one other people who were using Keynote at that conference, so I would have been fine. But I wouldn't have if I hadn't backed up my stuff. And do get some sleep. We're all great people, we have great conversations, lots of things to talk about, we're gonna be out at the bar all night, right? And then you're gonna get up in the morning and go, oh God. Don't do that. Because your audience is there to see you and the information you're going to impart. Don't be disrespectful to your audience showing up slovenly and hungover and late. Be a professional. Just before, hours before, confirm your demos actually still work. If not, you've got a backup plan, so it's fine. Shut down all other apps on your, except for your presentation software, especially those which might accidentally throw an embarrassing notification up on your screen. Um, and check your clothes and your hair. Do you, are you put together? Did you like accidentally drop some mayonnaise on your shirt and not notice it? Or do you have a little green thing in your teeth? You know, check all that. You want to check that. And like the session prior, or if there's no session prior, like 20 or so minutes before, um, if there's a session prior, sit in it so you're familiar with the room. But go to the loo, please. Um, and don't just, you know, pee, but also double check your clothes, your hair, your teeth, your fly. I actually saw a man once do an entire presentation with his fly open and not know it. Um, and the presentation was great, but it was a little distracting. Um, but do, again, be in the presentation room, and it allows you to get comfortable with the space. You know, as I'm setting up, I'm introducing myself to people and I'm talking to folks, you know, I'm getting comfortable with the people. I also need to introduce myself to the room. So the room and I are not strangers either. That's very important. So try and be in the session before, even if it's something you don't care about. Just before, turn off all your notifications, make sure everything is silenced, um, first time I got my Apple Watch, I didn't do that, and I spent an entire conference session with it buzzing on my wrist, and it was just irritating and so distracting, so do that. If you have pockets, you know, you're a man. Um, if you have pockets, empty them. Um, remove your lanyard. You know who I am, I'm on this schedule, where do I need to wear a big name tag down here? But it's also distracting to people. It catches the lights. It gets caught on microphones. And also, if you have a Milanese watch band here, it gets caught and does that on the magnet of your watch band for your Apple Watch, which is really good fun. Um, if you need inter internet, make sure it works. And finally, plug in your machine. Unless it's like a lightning talk in like five minutes or something like that, but always plug in your machine because you never know when Chrome is gonna go rogue and steal every scrap of battery power you have. So, do that. Are there any questions about what to do to, in advance of your talk? Okay, then after you talk, there is still more stuff to do. Actually, that's a really funny one. I wanna keep that up a second. So, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry. I shouldn't rush through the funny ones. Um, so, people are here to have a conversation and learn. I, they came to see you, and they will want to talk to you later, and I, uh, please encourage this, if at all possible. Some folks aren't comfortable doing this, and if you're not, again, you do you. Do what's comfortable for you. But I do encourage you to do this. It's very good for your career to have conversations with these people, and you never know what amazing stuff you're going to learn. So the hallway track is brilliant, especially if you're a speaker and you've got somebody who has a long question or wants to have a longer dialogue. You can ask them, please join you in the hall afterward. And then you can have really great conversations with people out in the hallway track. If there are birds of a feather session or other meetups about the things that you're discussing, go to them. Meet those people because they were probably at your talk. You can have great dialogues there. Share your contact information people uh, with people so they can reach out to you later. <clears throat> and social networking is great for conference speakers. You can engage with your audience online. Don't ignore them. These people are really important. They took the time to share something that you said with their entire network. Be touched by that, right? Reply to them in the mentions. Retweet stuff. Fave things. But do engage with them and have dialogues with them in that space. <clears throat> share your stuff. 
keep the information flowing to people out there. This has been great. As I watch conferences, it's like the default now to have video. It didn't used to be. But I also make my own videos, as I mentioned. I put them all in Internet Archive. Ask me how, and I will show you. Um, if you do any sort of posting of things, like your slides and your videos, please, for the love of dog, license your shit. Because just having it out there means anyone can use it. And you have no control over it if you have no license. If you want help with licensing your stuff, please talk to me and I will help you. It's really easy. But if you don't license it, then you have no recourse when somebody steals it. So please, license your stuff. Well, you do have some recourse, but it involves lawyers and oh, you don't want to get there. Um, and if you do have additional code, put it on some publicly accessible place, your Git thing of choice. Uh, feedback is very important. Um, I get feedback all the time on my talks and I love it. It is the bread and butter of my life. I love getting feedback. But you can't improve if you don't get it. So how do you get it? Lots of conferences build this into their software. So uh, they will like send out an email, hey, rate this talk. Give people feedback. But most of them don't. So it's up to you if you want feedback to seek it out. There are some services which will allow you to do that. Joined in is something specifically for conference feedback. But you also could just roll your own with Google Forms, with SurveyMonkey, whatever, and just throw a link up on your final slide and say, hey, rate me, please. Um, social networks and in-person are my preference, though, because then I get to actually engage with people. And if somebody comes up to me and say, hey, I saw your talk, I was like, great, thank you for being there. That's amazing. Is there anything? I could do differently? Is there anything I missed? And just start a dialogue with people that way, either on Twitter or in person. Um, and I get the best stuff that way. And once you get the feedback, what do you do with it? First of all, remember, reviewers are usually at the extremes of the spectrum. The people in the middle, they can't be buggered to write a review at all or give you feedback. People have strong feelings and that motivates them to participate in rating systems. So the person who's really super excited about it, yay, you know, that's awesome, but there's going to be somebody who's really not so excited about it. Don't take it personally. It's just the internet. Um, so you use your feedback to improve your talk. Lots of people say, I can't do that talk before I did it at this other conference. Gosh, that would be like cheating on that other conference. I can't share my stuff with other people that way. Are you kidding me? Are you daft? Do you know how many hours you put into this thing and you're only going to stand up here and give it for 40 minutes? No. Get a good return on your investment and give this talk multiple times because you have something valuable to give to people. Share it in multiple places as frequently as makes sense for you and your audience. Now, to improve your talk, you kind of need to keep your talk. What do you do? I use version control. Yes, this is my GitLab uh, repository of all of my presentations throughout. Uh, it's, it's actually most of them. It's, there's more that got lost before I started using this sort of thing. Not only does it have all my presentations, it has all of my conference proposals I've ever submitted. It has all of the bios I've ever used. You know what this does? It makes it ridiculously easy for me to propose talks to future conferences because I have the text written already. And I can just grab it and use it again. It also makes it very easy for me to iterate on and improve my talks because I have a version of this for every year and every conference where I have given it. And I can just copy that over and start making improvements. Now, how do I know what improvements to make? When I receive feedback, there's this little thing up here known as issues. That's right. I use an issue tracker for them, and I will create an issue with all of the feedback from this talk. So next time I do it, which coincidentally is in December in Petaluma, California, if you would like to come join North Bay Python, um, you know, I will be able to go back and say, oh, what was that thing that dude said about the stuff and the items? Oh, right. I wrote it down. Plus, it's really satisfying to close the issue when I'm done. 
So uh, this is a great way to make sure you never lose your stuff. It also is a good way to get feedback. My repository is not public, so feel free to go look for it. Um, but it's not public. I do, however, share it with select individuals whom I have learned to trust and to use as speaking mentors. And I will ask them, hey, can you have a look at this new talk? Cause, and they'll give me feedback there. And it's a really great way to do it. So, <coughs> oh, I made it so far without coughing. Um, just to wrap up, any final questions? I want to make sure that these stay up here so you can see them. Don't be afraid of using my contact information. Please hit the public speaking repository. If you do IRC, there is also an IRC channel for it called public speaking, hashtag public speaking on Freenode. So you can come and talk to people in real time and get feedback on your talks, on your proposals, on anything you need. And there's lots of people there now who are willing to help you. And most of them are really experienced speakers. So it's a great place to get. And they really want to help. And there are the slides. Um, and again, once I get to Tasmania where I have real internet, I will have my practice videos up there. Are there any questions now that we've run ridiculously over? Yes, hello. Um, how long would you go um, with a talk without having a break? Like, do you mm. put it that if it's going to be two hours, you have a break for one hour and a half? It depends. Uh, so the question is, how long do I go without a break in a talk? But it's going to be two hours. Sorry. Um, do I usually have a break at the one hour mark? It depends upon where it makes most sense to break the content. In this case, it would have been in between five and six, in between the, uh, you know, here's how you write and prepare your talk, and here's how you present it. That's where it would have fallen. Um, I usually would have a break right in that spot, but I knew that this was going to run long. And I wanted you all to be able to get out for pizza and beer or whatever it is you're doing. Good question. Thank you. Is there another one? Otherwise, I would like to get you out to your pizza and beer or whatever. Um, all right. So with that, uh, can we please all thank Vicky?